Hello, welcome, welcome back. It's Sarah from Roadworthy. Yes, I'm looking a little disheveled. We have been busily packing, getting organized. Um, my husband and I are getting ready to take a road trip down to Oregon. So we're gonna go on the Oregon side of the Columbia River Gorge, and then we're gonna go down into uh, Central Oregon to go to the Painted Hills and the John Day Fossil Beds. Um, this is sort of in high desert part of Oregon. So had never been there before, kind of excited. We'll do some hiking and explore the area. So hopefully I'll have some footage for you. Um, couple things. I think my microphone isn't working anymore. I think it died. Um, because I filmed this earlier today and it had no sound. So, I'm hopeful that with just some editing magic, the sound will be okay here today. If not, bear with me because I'll have to get another microphone. Um, what else? Um, I'm filming this a little early to accommodate our trip and I'm hoping I will be able to film on location next week, but that may be a little late. So, you know, let's just go with the flow um, and see what happens. So before uh, I, I wanted to talk about three books today that uh, are all unexpectedly in conversation with each other. Uh, so they all seem to explore uh, this idea of complicity. So let me start with the first one, which is Mobility by Lydia Kiesling. This is one, um, I, I want to say I heard a Kirkus review, of, or saw a Kirkus review, or read a Kirkus review of this one, and then I saw uh, Priscilla from Evening Reader talk about this book, and I had a difficult time sort of explaining what this book was about and why she loved it, and just her inability to sort of find the words is partly what intrigued me about this book. Somehow, whatever she said made it sound compelling enough for me to immediately put it on hold. So I will link Priscilla's video below. Also, in case I'm not really able to describe this book and why I loved it too, <laughs> you can watch Priscilla's video and see if she does a better job. Uh, so hopefully between the two of us, we can convince everybody to pick up this book. So what is, what is this about? So this is a, a uh, family from Texas whose dad is in the foreign service and um, is in Baku, Azerbaijan. And this is in 1998. And uh, Bunny is our, our 15 year old protagonist who uh, is in Baku because it's the summer holidays. And Bunny is sort of unlikable in that teenage girl way. Um, she's completely self-absorbed, completely oblivious to anything that's going on around her, completely feels like the adult world is sort of not worth paying attention to. Um, you know, so there'll be these conversations happening at parties or wherever she is or because of her dad's work and the people that she meets um, around the oil industry in Azerbaijan, around the corruption. And uh, since the um, Soviet Union uh, collapsed and the Russians have left Baku, sort of all this oil wealth sort of 
came up for grabs and, and sort of what happened. Um, what happened, uh, you know, some of the efforts by the American government um, on behalf of American oil, um, you know, British government on, on behalf of BP, just a lot of the shenanigans. And this is all being talked about in around around Bunny, and it's like bouncing off of her like she's Deflon. And she's fixated on, you know, her hair. Uh, is she wearing the right clothes? Um, there, there's a wonderful scene. Uh, they're invited to, I don't know, the Hilton or the Hyatt puts in a hotel in Baku and invites uh, her dad and the family uh, to, to come to a pool party. And she's obsessed with removing her pubic hair <laughs> at short notice. And I mean, it was just fantastic because I think all young women have had that experience. Um, so anyway, wonderful. Um, then we sort of jump a little bit into the future. Uh, Bunny's graduated college with an English degree um, and she is back home in Texas living with her mother um, after her parents' divorce. And Bunny is that perfect 20 something, you know, young 20s, doesn't know what to do with her life. You know, but seemingly everybody else has it together. They're going to law school, medical school, whatever. And she's like, ah. Um, and she eventually ends up in a job with a family oil company. And she is working in the sort of new division, looking at uh, renewables and green energy technology. Um, and, and her career grows with that division. And you sort of see in the passage of time, her career growing, you know, she ends up dating, getting married. Um, you know, she ends up involved in marketing for this company. And what's interesting is Kiesling does a fantastic job of seeing, showing you how time is passing and Bunny is, is successful by just, you know, mentioning where she's shopping. Uh, the brand of her clothes or her handbag um, or mentioning her, you know, blowout at the salon um, or her spa day with her mother, right? So these are the hints that you get that time is passing and uh, that, that Bunny is increasingly financially successful. Um, I, I loved that. Um, and I, I, you know, you, you hear Bonnie will mention um, voting for Obama. Uh, she bought a Prius. She is concerned about, you know, global warming. And, um, you know, she's got these, these, the outward appearance of she's doing all the right things. Um, and when people sort of challenge her, well, you work for an oil company, she's like, no, 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 I, I work for the division that's focused on renewables and green energy. I saw a interview with Kiesling um, where one of the things that she talks about is one, she was fascinated by the oil industry um, and it is fascinating um, and there is quite a bit in here of kind of how not necessarily nefarious but but how just large and ubiquitous and and how the influence of the oil and gas industry is is everywhere it just it 
permeates everything. Um, and, and that is really well illustrated in this book. The other thing that she talked about being really interested in is when does complacency become complicity? And that is smack dab what this book really, really delves into well. Bunny, again, she seemingly does all the right things, but yet she's part of the oil and gas industry, you know? Um, and, 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 and she's in marketing. So part of what she's doing, and you can kind of see when she's at these, these events and, you know, conferences and, you know, blah, 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 like, like she's marketing, like they're talking about how to use, um, you know, in oil companies' investment in green technologies as a way to put a spin on oil companies are at the forefront of dealing with, you know, climate crisis. You know, it's like complete bullshit, right? But this is, this is her job. Um, so anyway, just really, really fascinating. And I have been thinking a lot about this idea of complacency as complicity. And, and there are some uncomfortable moments in this book when you, when you kind of realize, you know what, we're, 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 we're all a little bit bummy. You know, um, you know, sometimes we're, we're all a little bit complacent sometimes and, and that makes us complicit. Um, and, you know, and again, I think Bunny is someone you could easily, as an author, could have easily painted Bunny in a way that you hate her. And, you, and again, you really can't um, because you, you realize you know, she's just chasing all the same dreams that we all are. Um, and so again, it's kind of hard to be critical. Um, particularly because, you know, we're all, we're all a little bit bunny. So a super fantastic book. Um, hopefully, if I have not sold you on this book, again, please watch Priscilla's videos so that she's sold you on this book. Like hopefully one of us has sold you on this book. Next, Belonging, uh, A German Reckons with History and Home by Nora Krug. This was on a list of like, you know, graphic novels that everybody should read kind of thing in my library. Um, and I hadn't heard of this one, so uh, this is why I picked it up. Um, Nora Krug has been living in the United States for quite some time. She's married to an American uh, man. Um, and she grew up in Germany. Her parents were both born immediately following World War II. Um, so she... she um, let me let me quickly get you let me see if i can oh here's a wonderful so she does this this is her her uh home this is her mom and and here she is and they they're living right next to an american base or in germany uh this is 1980. um so so photographs are included in here um as you know uh, as well as, you know, straight up comics. Um, she's got these little, um, do, 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 do. Oh, I can't find it. Um, so one of the things that she, she explores in this book, in the beginning of this book, she really talks about her shame and embarrassment about being German. Um, and talking about trying to hide her, her German-ness, pretending maybe she's Swiss. 
um, she describes sort of this uncomfortable moment uh, meeting an, an older woman at a party in Brooklyn and the woman sort of says oh you know I hear your accent are you German yes you know it, oh it's a beautiful country oh when were you last there and Nora sort of putting two and two together that this woman was in a concentration camp in Germany. Um, and we're talking about sort of removing any, you know, relics of, of German culture in her house, but yet having this deep longing for connection to her German heritage. Um, and, and as it goes on, there'll be little snippets like, um, oh, I just, I just found one. Gosh, darn it. Where did it go? Um, here we go. She'll have these, these snippets that are from the notebook of a homesick emigre, right? Well, she'll describe something, um, you know, that is is German, uh, part of German culture that she can't access in the United States, uh, but that she just has the soft spot for. Um, so um, she talks about, um, she had a great uncle, not a great uncle, excuse me, an, an uncle. Her dad had an older brother who died as a soldier in the war. And she finds this statistic. Her uncle was born in 1928 and finds this statistic that the Nazi government was in like 1936, indicating that all children, 90% of children born in 1928 were part of the Hitler Youth. And she, in, and she includes other sort of statistics like this. Again, starting to dance around, what is my family's association with the Nazi party? Um, of course, her parents have said, oh, no, of course not, you know. Um, but again, when you hear facts like this, like, she's like, how could I not think my uncle was in the Hitler Youth? Um, she finds statistics about, you know, voting records, right? And, and she's like, really, you know, and of course, you know, her family claims, oh, no, no one ever voted for the Nazis. But, you know, in the, you know, 1933 election or something in her hometown, you know, 1% of people did not vote for the Nazis. Um, and she's like, you know, what's the chances that my family didn't vote for the Nazis? And so she decides she really needs to delve into her family's history to either dispel the guilt and shame that she feels or come to terms with it. And so she sort of charts that journey of going back, looking in archives, digging up historical records, finding her uncle's um, war uh, archive, his war service folder file, um, you know, meeting historians, blah, 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 and, and finding out, you know, what, what happened in my dad's village, you know? Um, and, you know, some of her questions are answered. Some are not answered in the way that she hoped. You know, other questions surface. Um, so she's never able to really satisfactorily answer what her, what her family did during the war. But, but she's able to sort of surmise. Um, and... And, and sort of come to terms with her own German heritage, as, as well as the history of her family. Um, I thought this was incredibly powerful, incredibly interesting. 
um, and and yeah, just just kind of fascinating to think about. And again, you know, she digs into the issue of how complacent were her family, how complicit were her family. Um, all those same issues um, come up in this book. Um, so again, you know, fascinating. Um, definitely, uh, you know, worth a couple hours of your time to to read. So that's a good one. The last one I have to talk about is an audio book, Allow Me to Introduce Myself by Oni Luabanelli. And she is a Nigerian British author. Um, and this is a story about Anuri, a Nigerian British girl who's uh, 25 years old, so a young woman, excuse me, um, who is essentially a recovering social media star. <laughs> um, so kind of what happened is um, Anuri was born in Nigeria and her mother died uh, from complications of childbirth. And her dad is, is, you know, grieving the loss of the love of his life and has this baby who he obviously has complicated feelings for um, because it's his, you know, the birth of his child is what led to the death of his wife. Um, and he eventually decides to go to England uh, because this was the dream that he and his wife had. Um, he f finds ch caring for Anuri challenging and ends up hiring this nurse, Ophelia, to come and care for Anuri a couple of evenings a week. So, you know, help him out. Um, and Ophelia just falls in love with this baby and, and then eventually falls in love with Anuri's dad. Um, and similarly, you know, uh, it's sort of this weird Tobey Maguire thing, right? Where she loves the kid first and, and then decides to... Um, you know, you're never quite sure, does she genuinely interested in this? I don't know. Anyway, I had questions. But, um, and then Anuri's dad, um, again, he sees the, the love and care that this woman provides for his daughter. And he, he eventually falls in love with Ophelia as well. Um, and, and they get married. Um, and Ophelia decides to start a blog uh, so that Anuri's relatives in Nigeria can see pictures of her and see her growing up and blah, blah, blah. Well, this eventually turns into Ophelia having uh, this mom-fluencing empire. The blog turns into Instagram posts and YouTube videos. Um, she has sponsorship deals. She develops, you know, product lines that she's selling of, you know, baby care items and, you know, whatever. Um, and writes a parenting book. You know, all, all of this stuff is basically built because of the images that she is publishing of Anuri. And so this book is told in, you know, when Anuri is 25, but she's relating incidents of when she was a kid, you know, things that had happened um, that lead to Anuri's significant mental health issues, her, her significant issues 
trusting other people and relating to other people. And you, you, she relates sort of what happened when she was about 14 years old and put her foot down and said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not participating. Um, and, and then also in the present day, you have Anuri struggling because she has a younger sister, Noelle, who's about five, who is sort of going through all the same things. Ophelia has her mom fluencing empire now around Noelle, and Noelle is starting to rebel and push back. Um, and Anuri is, it feels like she's got to help her younger sister escape. Um, so this is, it, this is a really fascinating <laughs> book. Uh, a lot about the ethics of uh, parents posting social media content, driving financial benefit on the backs of their children um, who can't really consent, uh, who don't really have the power to, to say no. Um, there, there's some interesting things. Ophelia is white, so there's some interesting things about um, race. There's things about class, um, and 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 again that complicity. Um, Anuri's dad just sort of sticks his head in the sand and goes along with this, even though you know he can't quite face. Um, that his daughters are, are struggling. Um, so again, you sort of see his complacency and, and how that, that contributes to complicity. Um, you know, I think this could be a really, really hard book for somebody to pull off. It would be very easy to make Anuri look like a saint and Ophelia to come across as a demon <laughs> and a horrible, horrible person. But you do get chapters here and there from Ophelia's perspective, from uh, Anuri's dad's perspective, um, and you can see again how, for her dad, how his grief and how he really feels like Ophelia saved him and Anuri in some ways, and so he feels very beholden to her and is scared to rock the boat. He's scared to lose Ophelia, scared to lose his daughter, you know, and it's just sort of paralyzed. Um, and with Ophelia, you, you start to see how much social cachet um, she's deriving from this, how she's getting praise and notoriety when um, her, her, she has some baggage from her past that you can sort of see why she might be craving this sort of social acceptance. Um, and, and you also see how, you know, social media takes on a life of its own. You know, once you start to have success, you kind of have to feed the beast to keep it going, right? You have to keep posting. You have to keep generating content in order to get new sponsorship deals and to, to keep the money rolling in. And you can also kind of see how Ophelia and Anuri's dad sort of get trapped in this cycle where they got to keep it going. Um... So just really, really fascinating um, book. And again, I, I feel like she does a fantastic job of having these um, really three-dimensional characters. Um, nobody looks squeaky clean and nobody is completely evil you know they're, they're all 
have sides and facets that, that make them really complicated and make this situation more complicated um, than, than I think it, it, it might seem to be at, at first, first blush. So another just really, really great book. So all three of these books were really, really fantastic, and I want people to pick them up. And it just interesting and total serendipity how these books were sort of in conversation with one another. Um, so really, really fantastic reading week. Um, and I'm hoping that it continues while I'm on vacation. <laughs> um, hope you all are reading some amazing things. And um, again, I'll try and see you all on time next week, but uh, you know, maybe a little late. So let's just roll with it. All right.